Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Long day? <laughs> the after party is closer, so we're, we're, we're getting closer. Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a few remarks and then maybe open it up to some questions, hear what's on your mind, kind of what you're seeing as some of the challenges, um, any, any successes that you, that you ha have recognized, and sort of your vision for what we need to work on going forward. But I'll just share a little bit of a look back, uh, a reflection on the current state of our cannabis laws and regulation, and then, and then uh, talk about what the future might hold. Again, my name is Rob Bonta. I serve in the California State Assembly. I represent Oakland, Alameda, and San Leandro. I'm probably most known for having Max Michelonis in my office. Um, where's Max? Max is here somewhere. There's Max. So, um, uh, I mean, this is the man who wrote the MCR essay and uh, spent thousands of hours in, in meetings, um, you know, working it out with, with stakeholders. And I, I've... I feel like we've come a long way in a short period of time. And we're still not where we need to be, uh, but I think there has been a new mood and a new openness among California state legislators to address cannabis policy like any other policy issue uh, that affects our, our residents, it affects the people of California, it affects our businesses, our patients, um, our environment, um, our health and safety. and. And, and that is good because when we, when we were working on this issue back in, I think it was 2014 um, in the fall and then throughout 2015, that was not the case. We had a lot of legislators who, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but not really. When I would say, hey, I have this cannabis bill I'm working on, I'd love to have uh, your support. I'd like to explain it to you and let you know what it does, how it's good for California, how it's good for the environment, how it's good for patients, how it's good for safety. And they would almost put their fingers in a cross and back up slowly and say, that's the cannabis bill. Um, I'm a no on that. And it was just any mention of cannabis seemed bad. And because and, and it carried this stigma, right? And so through our work, and I say our because this has been very much a team effort between a number of legislators who, who sort of lifted up the, the original MCRSA work. It was Assemblymember Joan Sawyer, Assemblymembers Wood. Um, Assemblymember uh, Cooley, and a bipartisan group, Assemblymember Lackey, who, who worked on this t together uh, with, with myself to really do something groundbreaking, to, to do something that hadn't been done in 20 years, to provide this regulatory regime in the state of California for, for medical cannabis um, that we hadn't had since the passage of the Compa uh, Compassionate Use Act. And this had been something that had been tried. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, for lack of trying, it had been tried multiple times. And it had failed multiple times. And one of the reasons that I think we were able to, su to succeed was because we, we set about to address this in a different way, rather than have one coalition of stakeholders on one side that had traditionally been together, largely the League of California Cities and public safety uh, folks uh, on, on one side and have sort of our, our patient advocates and, 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 and labor and industry on the other. Um, we decided to work together and invite a big table uh, and say anyone who's interested in making our cannabis policy better, stronger, more effective, working out the kinks and uh, doing something historic, you're welcome to come to this table and put your best ideas forward and they will be considered. They might not always be implemented or included in the final uh, piece of law, but they will be considered. And, and, and that's what we did, and, that, and that's, that's where Max came in, that's where uh, someone else you may know in the cannabis world uh, who's, who's now working, who was on my staff at the time, Anshi So, came into play. They both worked um, hours and hours lift, listening to everyone um, and tried to, get, uh, to try to get the best piece of legislation possible. And uh, we, we, we slowly made progress, we, we, we kept moving past hurdles where in the past legislation had fallen down and failed and either failed in committee or gotten held. And then we finally got on the verge of the governor's desk. And then uh, when you're close to the governor's desk, that's when he gets engaged. And he started um, looking more closely at the legislation, had his staff get involved, and they had some ideas that they wanted to include as well. And so we were able to have a, a discussion with the governor's office. And then in 2015, we got the MCRSA passed. And that was exciting because it had never been done before. And that was exciting because it had been done in a way that had never been done before with, with a coalition working together side by side. And, and that group, of legislators and stakeholders, I think, continue to be committed to, 
to, to the approach. I think the, 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 the approach drove the result and al allowed us to do something unprecedented, and, and we want to continue to do that. And, and we felt that we made a significant contribution to, to medical cannabis policy in the state of California. We knew it wasn't perfect. When you do something that big, it's impossible to get it right, uh, just right, to get it perfect. It's going to have unintended consequences. It's going to have components that, that uh, are intended to do one thing but don't accomplish that. Um, there'll be some blind spots that get revealed where you, you expected it to do something, but so something else kind of squeezed out the side. And then you've got to be committed to the ongoing work to fix those challenges, and we have. And we, a big part of that is, is you. Uh, you know, you're the experts. You're on the ground. Um, you know how the law impacts you, uh, impacts uh, businesses, patients, um, the environment. So that feedback loop is critical to us. And, and a lot of legislators say, we want to hear from you. I mean, we really want to hear from you um, to, to share with us what's needed next in the next iteration to you know, move towards perfection of our, our our cannabis policy in the state of California. I, I came at this from a, a certain perspective. I was chair of the Assembly Health Committee at the time. I've been on the Assembly Health Committee um, my entire time in the legislature. I saw this as an important issue for patients, uh, that, that, that voters, for whom voters had approved access to, to, to cannabis as medicine, and I wanted to make sure that that was high quality medicine, that it was tested, that it was reliable, that those with um, compromised immune systems weren't put at risk. Um, and I also came at it as a representative from Oakland, who, uh, as you know, there are, are, are many pioneering cannabis leaders uh, from my city. And, and so I wanted to um, work with others to, to, to try to uh, get the right policy. But, but, you know, this wasn't something that when I ran for legislature back in 2012, I thought I would be working on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm proud and glad I have. But really, it relies on, on being uh, the next policy components rely rely on you. And so, um, fast forward one year from fall of 2015 and it's, uh, fall of 2016, and in literally a year, we get the MCRSA passed, and then we get Prop 64 passed. And and so, where a year before we didn't have any medical cannabis regulations and adult use cannabis was not legal, and now both are in effect. And so that, that's a lot of movement in a short period of time. And uh, that Prop 64 was based on the MCRSA, but it had some um, noted departures from our work. And um, I supported Prop 64 as well. And you know, definitely I, there, I do have pride of ownership, but not that much pride. I, I was, I was, I was uh, fine with the overall approach. And, and, and I think Prop 64 brought a lot of people behind it, uh, whether it be uh, you know, patient advocates or, or, or those in the industry themselves, or social justice folks, criminal justice reform folks, folks who believe that the, what it was, that the war on drugs was a failure and it needed to be uh, fixed and addressed and there needed to be some changes going forward. And, and that, it brought a lot of libertarian folks who thought um, that the government shouldn't be deciding uh, whether or not you can use adult use cannabis since you're an adult. And, and, and the, the election showed that. The, the, the numbers were strong. It was 57% throughout the state of California. And, and so now we have adult use passed as well. And we've been trying to roll out the regulations every year. We've been working with the Bureau. Uh, we've been always trying to improve and strengthen and, and build on the work that, that we, we, we got done with MCRSA and, and Prop 64. I have a bill that's right now on the governor's desk that would help uh, speed up the process for uh, expungements and reductions in, in, in cannabis crimes. Thank you. Um, maybe the panel beforehand was talking about that and other issues. I know, uh, but you know, my view is this is a substantive right that was given by Prop 64. The people of California voted by a supermajority that um, not only going forward will cannabis be le legal. Um, but that it has a retroactive impact and, and it, it should be able to, it should change your criminal record. And that, that conviction that had been haunting you and chasing you and following you around and making it difficult to get housing and making it difficult to get a job, you should no longer have to deal with that. Uh, but the process is burdensome. It's confusing. It's costly. Uh, it's time consuming. And a lot of folks aren't taking advantage of it because of those reasons, because they need to take a day off from work and go to court 
uh, and, and file papers and maybe have a lawyer. Um, and they need, to, they need to even know that the, the right is theirs, that, that it's something that, that they enjoy and they can pursue. And, and I think this is somewhere where government should be able to step in. This is sort of a classic good government role where the right is already, it's already been decided that individuals deserve this right. Now, now make it so and use the, the, the power of government. Use, use, use the fact that the DOJ has a database where they can search for all of the qualifying cannabis crimes and they can do a data dump, literally, and provide it to the district attorneys who can have a chance to review them and challenge them if they like. And if they don't, then these crimes should be wiped or reduced. And uh, that should all just be done by operation of law. And uh, so the governor has a few more days to sign this bill. I'm getting nervous because it's because <laughs> he has till the end of the month, um, and he hasn't done it yet. Um, but I think he 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 sort of takes he addresses bills in in sort of uh, thematic groups, and so maybe he hasn't addressed all of the cannabis uh, bills yet. But I'm but I'm very hopeful for that one. That one is, 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 it's a bill that got a lot of support, including support from law enforcement folks and others, and I think it's just a, it's a bill that will really help achieve social justice. It'll show that government can work for the people, and it'll, it'll um, make people's lives better who are hurting because of these, these convictions. And so I, I'm proud of that bill, and uh, I hope it gets signed by the governor, so I got my fingers crossed. Um, thank you. You know, we also, I, I want to give a shout out to Fiona Ma. Uh, I know she may have been here earlier or maybe coming. Uh, but we worked for a number of years together. First of all, I'm a big supporter of her. She's going to be our next treasurer. She's forward-thinking and open-minded, and she embraces the, the cannabis industry and, and wants to create better uh, solutions and, and, and make the system work. And she and I have been, in particular, a, 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 a team that's worked together. And we wanted to do something that I thought was practical and simple, and we, we set about to do it last year, which was to, to take away the 10% penalty on the non-EFT uh, tax payments um, because the cannabis industry can't pay uh, uh, through, through electronic fund transfer given the, the federal overlay and, and the, the cash uh, uh, business or, or, or the all-cash nature of the business. So uh, that bill actually, we, we tried again this year and that bill is signed, it's the law. There's no more 10% penalty uh, for paying uh, tax payments in cash. I think that provides equity and fairness. It encourages our cannabis businesses to pay their taxes, uh, which is a good thing from, from the perspective of the government um, and, and businesses. So we, we got that bill passed and we're excited about that. One that I regret uh, we didn't get passed, which I, I, I really feel was necessary. Um, and I'm open to seeing how we address it going forward, but was the, was the three year reduction in excise taxes and, and a complete moratorium on the cultivation tax. We're in, a, we're in a, a time of transformation right now. You know, with, with laws going into effect in, in January of this year and the new regime being implemented, we wanted to encourage as many folks as possible to move from the black and gray market to the regulated market. That, that, that's what this whole proposition was, the proposition of, of the MCRSA, the, the proposition of, of, of Proposition 64. It said, um, Come out of the shadows, come into the light, embrace a regulated marketplace where you follow all the rules. And if you do, you'll be a, a business just like any other California business, creating good jobs, paying your taxes, and uh, being fully compliant with the law. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that our businesses aren't undercut by the gray and black market where they're, um, uh, where they're not paying their taxes, where they're, where they're, uh, they're undercutting uh, based on cost savings because of, because of the cost of compliance that they're not following. And in order to do that for a temporary period for three years, I thought it made sense to reduce the taxes, um, to, to invite and encourage and spur along that migration from the black and gray market to the, um, to the regulated marketplace. Uh, but not all of my colleagues agreed. And it's a, uh, it's a legislature with, uh, it, with multiple branches of government and multiple members in the legislature, not a monarchy, and we weren't able to get that done. What I was excited about was that was a bipartisan effort. Assemblymember Tom Lackey was the co-author along with me. We got a good amount of support along the way in committee and uh, it got held in, in appropriations on the assembly side. So maybe we try again on that, or maybe we sharpen our pencils and roll up our sleeves and decide a, a, a better way to do it, a more effective way to do it. But uh, you know, in the discussion part of this, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that bill and, and, and what the future might hold. Um, 
uh, one other thing that the legislature wasn't ready yet for yet was protection of medical patients in the workplace. Um, I was ready for it. I, <laughs> I, I think it makes it's common sense. It's, it's practical um, that a medical cannabis patient, like any patient using medicine, sh should have their status as a, as a medical patient protected, uh, should be reasonably accommodated. Um, and obviously, we had some components in there where, um, you know, in safety-sensitive jobs, it wouldn't apply. And, and, and this is an area where the state of California would not be the first to do this. Other states have done it, including red states. And so we need to catch up and um, we need to do better by our, our employees. Because right now, the incentive is to not use cannabis and instead to use things like opioids, which we know we have an opioid uh, epidemic and that cannabis can be a, a safer, healthier uh, alternative. Uh, so what that tells me is that while we've made progress, while we're, we've moved the needle, while our trajectory is heading in the right direction, we're, we're not able to do everything that's necessary yet. And I think sometimes it's incremental. Sometimes there's a, there's a time and a place for, for each policy. And maybe this year wasn't the, the, the time uh, for, for that, but, but, but maybe next year will be. And so we, we have to continue our efforts. And you know, meanwhile, uh, we, we're dealing with a federal administration that's tough on cannabis. That makes it harder to make the progress that we, that we need. I, you know, I, I always thought that maybe with a different president, we'd have um, a rescheduling or a descheduling, um, that we'd have uh, more openness uh, to, to what states are doing and, 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 and deference to states' rights, um, more along the lines of the Cole Memo, but even more. And instead of a, you know, a, a retraction of the Cole Memo, which is what we have, and, a, and an attorney general who is um, hostile towards cannabis. So the federal overlay makes things tougher. And the, the Schedule I um, nature of the drug in the eyes of the federal government makes it tough. And, and so does the fact that there's no banking. That, that makes it very difficult for our businesses to be, to be uh, successful and to thrive. So for sure, Choppy waters ahead, challenges ahead, but my reflection is the the appetite of the California legislature is is growing to be supportive, to be open minded, to try to craft solutions, to try to fix problems in the cannabis space, to build on what we've done, uh, with a lot of self recognition that we didn't get it exactly right, that it's not perfect, that it needs to be improved, and the way to improve it is f through the input of you. Uh, you know, you literally telling me and Assemblymember Jones Sawyer and Assemblymember Wood and Lackey uh, and Cooley what needs to be done next. So um, I'd love to have our discussion include some of that. If, if you have some ideas about what's, what California, who prides itself in leading on so many things, and I think we are leading on cannabis, what, what else we need to do to sort of uh, cement that role as, as leaders in the cannabis space. So um, I want to thank you for all that you do. I know it, uh, it hasn't always been easy. Uh, to be in, in the cannabis world. I think it's, uh, hopefully it's, it, it's getting easier, although the regulated marketplace is uh, not something I guess you'd put, you'd put the label easy on. Uh, but it is, but it, I feel like it is necessary when we, when we wanna support our good actors and, and as bring any, as many people into the regulated marketplace as, as possible and sort of, sort of shed that stigma for good and, and uh, keep working and building on, on, on creating a, a more perfect cannabis policy in the state of California. So with that, I'll end my remarks and just say thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here with you. Thank you for this uh, State of Cannabis Conference. I was here a couple years ago, and it uh, seems like it's growing, and, and, and we're always getting um, better thought partners and, and engagement, and um, look forward to your questions and to our discussion. Thank you. Homeland security issue that happened with the uh, transportation company two weeks ago. Did you hear about that? Tell me about it. So uh, Wild Rivers Transport was taking some cash somewhere that it needed to go, and they got pulled over by CHP, and then they got uh, they let them go, and then further down the road, Homeland Security came and got them and took their cash. Mm -hmm. And now they've retained um, Matt Cuman, and they're they're suing CHP. So you said there that you know we've got some issues uh, federally. Have you heard about this workaround with uh, Homeland Security? Apparently, 
uh, isn't held to Rohrbach or Farr. So there's some money there to come and do some enforcement. Have you heard about this? You know, we had um, a bill that I think would have helped with that. And this is where I need Max back in my office. Um, Assemblymember Joan Sawyer, uh, we were, it was sort of a, almost like a sanctuary st state approach to, to cannabis where in a place where, like California where we legalize medical and adult use cannabis, there would not be that ability to um, sort of re refer or tip off or communicate with uh, the federal government um, because it's legal in the state of California, similar to what we've done with our sanctuary state for our, our undocumented uh, friends and neighbors and, 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 and uh, immigrant residents. So maybe something like that would help address something like this. Um, the, the problem is, is something that, um, while hard to hear, is not shocking from the federal administration, and it might be something that is susceptible to a state fix um, along the lines of the Joan Sawyer bill that I was working on with him last year. Hey. Hi, Rob. Hey. Hey, thank you for all that you do for us, for the industry, and your tireless efforts in the legislature from no one will talk to you to now everybody wants to talk to you, so that's a help. Uh, one thing I'd like you to address is, uh, I haven't heard much talk on, is our friends at the League of Cities sending out a thing, you're going to have to ban or you're going to leave your, lose your rights to control it and the, the state is going to control it, and now some ungodly number of municipalities and counties and so forth have complete bans. Um, is there something at the state level that might uh, go, uh, I think we've learned that it's way, way easier to ban than to unban. And uh, you know, now with 80% of the cities and counties having bans, how does the state legislature look at that and is there any uh, help fix other than the regular thing of you know, changing hearts and minds? One of the, the key components of the MCR, CRSA that allowed it to pass and that was part of sort of the, the, the grand deal and the grand bargain and then later it was adopted uh, more or less by Prop 64 was this idea of local control. So the League of California Cities had, had traditionally been able to oppose legislation that did not have strong local control components, and, and, and those bills died. And so we believed th that in putting the MCRSA together in 2015, we would not be able to get a bill passed and signed by the governor if it didn't have a, a local control component. And uh, I, I think that's an absolutely accurate assessment. It's not guesswork. Um, you know, they, they would the league would have gone strong opposed, law enforcement would have gone strong opposed, and uh, legislators would have followed. So we would have had nothing. Um, there was also uh, a, a component in there that we had to fix when we came back in 2016, which was very unfortunate because uh, it was unintended, it got into the language, and it helped spur this sort of urgent um, call out to locals to, to ban because they thought they were gonna get preempted by the state and the state was gonna act for them if they didn't act. And so that was unintended. That's part of the, when, you know, when we do something this big, you don't get it, always get it right and there's some imperfections. That one had consequences. And, and when people decided to ban, it's, it's hard to reverse. It's, it's better when you start from a place of no action and you can decide a course, either, either ban or adopt. I think what we might be able to do, and, and, and so this is a huge issue, right? Um, we have adult use cannabis, we have uh, state licenses, but then we have a lot of places that are, are banning uh, uh, all or some of the supply chain in, in the cannabis marketplace. A lot are nervous about dispensaries, maybe more okay with manufacturers or testers, um, maybe even cultivators, uh, but a little more worried about dispensaries. And so this sort of the full supply chain in the marketplace that's needed is, is, is not robust enough. And and so we've had a number of you know, sort of roundtables to think about what the solution is to that. You know, one, one thought I had was it's weird if a locality, if the people have voted to have adult use cannabis, but their representatives, their city council or their supervisors 
say that we should have a ban. That seems like a, you know, a, a tension, a, a, a problem, a, a conflict. Um, Prop 64, to, to, to be fair, and MCRSA did say that locals could ban. And so, um, so maybe that's the way that gets harmonized in, in, in the eyes of those folks. But um, I think one of the things I had thought of was also having a sort of model um, template for um, loca locals to use. So they, like, I think people get overwhelmed. They're like, I don't know anything about cannabis. I'm a city council member. I came because I cared about public safety, or I cared about development projects, or I cared about parks. Uh, cannabis is new to me. It's just easier if I just ban it. Like some of my neighbors are kind of worried about it, and I want to have to deal with them when I go to the supermarket or the soccer sidelines of the soccer field. Those are all real examples for me when I was in city council. Um, not, not being afraid, but seeing people in, in the supermarket on, and on the sidelines of the soccer field. And so easier to ban. But if they had something that said, this is what the state proposes as a good, solid model template that you can adjust and tweak and make it work for you, but it, but it addresses some of the key issues, it highlights the, the key components uh, of, of what you might have, so that they can have a starting place and they can work with their, attorney, their city attorney and their city manager to get it right, you know, so this idea of providing tools to, to locals to help them get there, because I, I feel like they get overwhelmed. And I know that there are some efforts, uh, um, you know, Max, I guess this, is, this is the Max uh, keynote, uh, but Max has been working on, uh, had been working with a number of locals on, on, on just that, you know, getting into place a, a, a regime and, um, that, that supported and had the right safeguards and, and guardrails around cannabis, and maybe that's something that could be helpful as well. But it's a, we're in a tough spot because it requires reversal of bans, right? Again, if we, if we had no position instead of a ban position, it would have been easier. But I am open, and, and you know, we've, we've pulled together some people, uh, some of our thought leaders in cannabis policy in Sacramento to talk about this. Don't know that we've exactly figured it out, um, but I, I think that's an area that needs to get addressed, and we need to do something in the next legislative cycle. So if, if, if you have thoughts or others have thoughts, that's something, the problem is on our radar. The solution is, is not something that we're, we've arrived at yet. Uh, hello, my name is Alfonso. I'm a uh, content producer, and I am looking to get a public service announcement um, campaign where social equity and a more uh, accessible um, industry for, for people. Now, is that something where you could assist in directing me in getting some feedback and maybe... Um, getting those ideas to certain areas like in Los Angeles or up north or down in, in those areas that, where that message might be best received? Yeah, uh, for sure. Happy to, to talk to you further. I mean, this is a component that kind of animates the whole cannabis industry, this idea of, 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 of equity and, and social justice and providing opportunity to uh, particularly those communities that have been harmed by the, the, the prior uh, approach and policies towards cannabis. And um, we're working on things at the state level to help address that uh, on the regulatory side as, as well. I know uh, the Bureau and, and Lori Ajax is, are, is working on some things. We've had some roundtables about that. We have a bill uh, that would provide $10 million that, to support equity um, coming from the state. Uh, we've had ideas around um, incubators and sort of this idea of a golden ticket. If, 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 you, if you go through an incubator and you take certain steps and you're from um, uh, a community, a disadvantaged community that has that had been harmed in the past, you would be able to have uh, more direct access to a, to a license. Um, Oakland's done a lot on equity, maybe gone a little too far in some ways, but this, the spirit is, is right. So. You know, I'm right in the heart of kind of this equity discussion in, in Oakland, and, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it. <laughs> hey, hi, Assemblymember Banta. First of all, thank you for all of the work you've done, and Max, of course, um, and, and all the other uh, legislators. It hasn't gone unnoticed. We, we know where you played a role in this, so thank you. Um, so, God, there's just so many fixes that need to happen. 
in, in, the, in policy and the regulation side and all of it. So instead, I want to look a little into the future and ask you what your thoughts are on public consumption. We have an issue even here at this event. We have issues everywhere. We have people out smoking tobacco, right? And they can't smoke cannabis at a cannabis event. Um, and it's not just here. It's anywhere. I mean, it sounds like a little bit of a progressive policy, but by some token, it's working in Canada, right? In Canada, if you're a medical card holder, you can uh, smoke right on the street. Now, people hopefully can be responsible about it, but nevertheless, that is available. And, I, and do you, do, are you guys looking into that at all? Is that too far down the road? Or do you think that California could eventually come around where we could somehow figure out a safe way to have public consumption, despite the lounges that may open in cities, right? Just for everybody. Um, for, for me, for my crystal ball, if, if I looked into it today, I, I'd say probably not next year. Um, I, I think it's it's a number it's a it's it's an iterative process where you need to take one step and then take another step to, to get there. Uh, it'll Prop 64 did not allow for that, and so part of what voters just voted on included not having the the public consumption that that you refer to. But we have the Assemblymember Bill Cork Bill, which allows for. Uh, use in, 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 in more areas, and again, there's that local control component. If 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 the local, if the city uh, agrees on it, and I think, I think people need to see that use can occur beyond sort of personal use in your home, and can occur in certain at certain events for special events, and see that the world keeps turning and the sky doesn't fall, and then you do a little bit more, and then the same thing happens, but. If you go in one big step all the way to public consumption, then you know the fear mongers come out and the horror stories come out, and I think it's a little bit harder. Um, so I think it's a few years away, but I think steps towards it can be made. Yay! Hi. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming here. Um, you've raised so many uh, important points. I want to just raise two. First of all, taxes. Um, as a can longtime cannabis patient, um, I'm l losing my patience with being charged uh, an exorbitant sin tax for uh, a medicine that I actually really need. Uh, I do not do sales in the black, uh, uh, buy product from the black market anymore, but I'm one of those people, and I'm a long, I'm a cannabis trade journalist in this industry, but I can't afford it anymore, so I'm going to be uh, I'm going to go back to narcotics or black market or nothing or something like that. So, and I'm kind of so upset about it that I may become a full-time consumer activist on this subject because the, the, the tax regime, the patchwork, the layering on affects the entire food chain and the entire cannabis market. I just wanted to say that as a comment. But I wanted to ask you about what is called an extinction event. Um, people have used that term in California. I believe that California's cannabis legacy is in great part tied up in the future of the NorCal region. I've spent a lot of time up there talking to farmers, covering it. And you know, when people talk about an extinction event, it's like a really serious term. And I'm curious what goes through your mind when you hear that. And I'm also curious if you have a sense of where the legislature in general is at with the idea that this entire region may go through what is being called an extinction event or what BDS Analytics says will be three extinction events. And I'm curious what you think about that. And also what the solutions are. I believe there was just a bill that would have allowed farmers markets that wound up in suspense. Um, and so there seem to be solutions that will help those farmers, help that region, help the future of this state and California's legacy. Yeah. Two great points. Let me take the, the first one first about medical patients and, and, and taxes. You know, that, that's kind of where my heart has always been in this discussion is with patients and um, you know, with someone dealing with chronic pain or, or a child dealing with seizures and, and making sure that they have access to the medicine, that, that helps them and, and um, makes them you know, feel better and, and, and uh, addresses their, their, their symptoms and their challenges. And so to the extent that we have a 
tax regime that makes it difficult for uh, those patients to, to, to receive the, med the medicine they need. I'm very open-minded to making changes and, and, and taking action that can help ensure that. I think there is, I mean, I think there's a sales tax exemption, right, for, for card holders. The but Right, right. So yeah, it's something, but it's not. Uh, it's not a lot. Um, I mean, the extinction event. That that worries me. That's disturbing. That makes me anxious. That's not something that we ever wanted or in, or intended. Um, I don't know if it's true, but the fact that it's being discussed is a problem. And you know, we always wanted folks who had been long time members of the industry who, who operated in, 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 in the gray, gray spaces because California hadn't yet um, regulated or, or made it lawful to be able to migrate to the, to the, to the regulated marketplace, to the lawful marketplace, to, to be able to embrace that marketplace and be a successful participant in it for many years to come. That was always the idea. And that was the intent. And, and you know, the, the mom and pops, the small farms, the, the growers that had been there for multi-generations yeah. Yes. And so, so the fact that that's a, that that's um, that we're dealing with that makes me want to talk to you more <laughs> and and figure out what we can do to 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 avoid it. So, um, I'll stay afterwards. I'll give you my card. And this is the time when we're preparing our legislative package. This is the time when we're actively soliciting input and ideas, and then we introduce our bills early next year. So, um, I want to learn more from you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Clark Brown, uh, attorney from Los Angeles, working on banking issues. Um, maybe related to the extinction concept. Um, if banking is not available, um, typically what goes on is those uh, businesses with larger resources and larger contacts are able to get by, and uh, small uh, businesses without banking uh, just disappear and get crushed. There was some discussion this morning about Banking, the only way, most likely way that gets resolved in California is that the federal issue has to get resolved. And there's pretty much no way forward other than that. Uh, I'm wondering if you agree, uh, if you think there are any other pathways to resolving, particularly for small business people in California, uh, for, to get banking support and be able to use banks uh, in development of a business which is required. I guess my short answer is I, I, I don't know if the federal fix is the only fix, but for a long time I've said that's the best way we're going to address this. And we have tried and, and, and scratched our heads and put pen to paper and, and imag imagined and reimagined other possibilities, um, you know, credit unions. I know. Um, Soon to be Treasurer Fiona Ma has been working on this. Current Treasurer John Chung has been working on this. Senator Hertzberg and I had a bill working on this this past year. Um, I, I'm open to the possibility of a creative fix to it, but I don't know what it is. And I think the, 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 the best way, the cleanest way, the most impactful way is for the federal government to act. And so, you know, that, that's not easy to hear right now given the constitution of the federal government and who's sitting in those, those decision-making um, seats. But it doesn't mean that that's what the future holds. It doesn't mean that uh, things might change you know, this November and they might change again in, in, in two years. So um, you know, real change could be two years away um, in an ideal world, but that doesn't create any comfort right now. Um, but I've always felt that the federal government has to act. Um, to, to really make it clean and, and to provide uh, the protections that businesses deserve. Having said that, I don't know all the answers. And if, if you or others that you're working with have a proposal that you think can work in the state of California, I'm all ears and, and, and if that can provide relief to businesses that need it faster, then I think we should try. Uh, I was just gonna say uh, state-owned public banking. Um, what do you think about doing a public bank for California which I think would be a way to like circumvent the federal restrictions in terms of getting banking and uh, banking um, cannabis businesses, cannabis growers. Um, what do you think about the idea of doing a California statewide uh, public bank? I, I, I think the statewide bank 
idea is a good one, generally. I think it, it's tricky. Um, and, you know, I think people, if it's, I don't know if it's South Dakota or North Dakota, I think f folks point to North Dakota, a lot smaller, a lot different than, than California. And even if we had a bank that, that allowed cannabis proceeds and revenue to be banked in it, at the, you know, a state bank, does it get FDIC insurance? I, 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 think, I think no. I mean, maybe the state provides that, that, that you know, something similar in terms of that um, uh, sort of insurance or, or guarantee. And then is it, is it susceptible to a federal raid and saying, you know, these are all, you know, the federal government, in our eyes, this is all criminal enterprise. The state of California, it might, you might be a state of California bank, but those revenues are from, in our eyes, criminal enterprise. And we're going to raid it and take it, and uh, it's going to be subject to forfeiture. You know, I think that's something that this president would, would, would love the opportunity to do. Um, but maybe there's ways to protect it. Maybe there's ways around it. Um, the state bank idea has come up many times. It's something that Max uh, has, has uh, spent some time analyzing and looking at. Others are as well. Um, if there's a way to do it um, from a policy perspective, then I think, I think again, we should, we should try. I think politically, it's really difficult. Um, the, the rest of the banking industry gets really nervous when, when the idea of a state bank gets brought up. All right. Since it's Cody Bass, we're going to take one more question. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was just curious if there's been any talk or anybody's approached you around uh, helping with some legislation around the annual fees with BCC. Uh, you know, we're looking at like a hundred thousand dollar annual fee once annual licenses become issued, which you know could be some time, uh, which could you know move into the next legislative session. You know, the idea that yes, you got to recover costs because of implementation. Uh, I, I feel like this first year. I mean, I mean, there's some talk that it will come down because the the you know it's not going to cost that much to continue regulation, but a hundred thousand annually is an unbelievable amount of money. Uh, even if we do over two and a half million a year, as we do, it's still just a very huge amount of money annually to be paying an agency. I mean, you pay that for a liquor license, but you can sell that liquor license in 10 years. And I think we need, le you know, uh, legislation to, to help operators make that happen. I'm just curious if you've heard of anything or if you would support that. I've definitely heard of that. You know, when we were talking about taxes and sort of this, this three-year moratorium on the cultivation tax and the reduction in the excise tax, Part of the conversation included why not help with the licensing fees? Those are um, very burdensome as well, and maybe some relief there could help. Um, and so I, I think that's an area where we can explore. Maybe that maybe because the the tax approach didn't work this year, maybe the the licensing fee uh, approach could, could could work next year with with some reduction, some relief to to our businesses. Um, I'm, I'm open to it, and I, and I think that that's, a, that's an area that we should explore and, and see if we can make it work to, to help our, our responsible, um, compliant businesses be successful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.